Welcome to the Homesteaders of America podcast, where we encourage simple living, hard work, natural health care, real food, and building an agrarian society. If you're pioneering your way through modern noise and conveniences, and you're an advocate for living a more sustainable and quiet life, this podcast is for you. Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm your host, Amy Fuel, and I'm the founder of the Homesteaders of America organization and annual events. If you're not familiar with us, we are a resource for homesteading education and online support, and we even host a couple of in-person events each year, with our biggest annual event happening right outside the nation's capital here in Virginia every October. Check us out online at homesteadersofamerica.com, follow us on all of our social media platforms, and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can be the first to know about all things HOA, that's short for Homesteaders of America. America. Don't forget that we have an online membership that gives you access to thousands, yes, literally thousands of hours worth of information and videos. It also gets you discount codes, an HOA decal sticker when you sign up, and access to event tickets before anyone else. All right, let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome back to the Homesteaders of America podcast. Thank you for joining me again this week. I have special guest, Rachel Hester. Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Amy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. All right. So for those of you who don't know Rachel, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay. So I'm Rachel Hester and I am in central Kentucky. We have eight and a half acres of old hay fields. So when we first moved there, we had no topsoil. So we did the typical homesteader thing and got all the poultry and tried doing eggs and poultry meat. But in Kentucky, everyone has eggs and poultry meat. So we now have sheep as our main farm product, and we still have the poultry for our own consumption. We have small lard pigs, we have honeybees, and we have a milk cow. So we're kind of trying the multi-species homesteading thing. Um, and then my husband works in emergency services, so we kind of have to do things a little differently than the you know typical homesteader because his schedule is crazy. So we've had to learn how to make our animals very flexible, which has its own set of challenges and stuff. So. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're just homesteading away over there, and that's awesome. Today we are specifically talking about dairy sheep. Um, you guys who have been listening consistently to the podcast know the last couple of episodes have been about sheep, breaking down the different uses for sheep and how to raise them. And there's been some fantastic nuggets of information in all of those episodes. And But today, Rachel and I are specifically going to talk about dairy sheep because this is Rachel's specialty. She is an expert. She is the cause of me getting sheep, dairy sheep. Yes. <laughs> um, she was like, Hey, did you know that you could do this and this and get dairy? Sheep? <laughs> I did. Uh, yeah, she did. She was totally an enabler. I did. I did. It wasn't evil plan. So anyhow, Rachel, let's dive in. Let's talk about dairy sheep. Why don't you give us just a general lowdown of dairy sheep and who they might work for? What homesteader they might work for? Sure. Okay. So dairy sheep, are, are awesome. I'll just start there because they're, you can get three products from them. You know, a lot of people are concerned with a dual purpose animal and sheep can be a tri-purpose animal. And if you want to go into like the nitty gritties of all the other products they have, they can be a multi product animal. So if you, if you want them for dairy, you can get milk, you can get meat and you can get wool. And then you can also go into things like their manure is really beneficial. I think the other mm -hmm. people you interviewed talked about that a bit. With dairy sheep, the dairy specific breeds are all wool breeds. And so you get actually quite a bit of lanolin, which is a very nourishing byproduct. Um, it makes really good skincare products and stuff. So we like them. And the other thing is they don't require as much property as larger livestock, like a cow or large breeds of pigs and that kind of thing. So, you know, and with dairy sheep, you can, you can have one or two sheep for the milk and that, yeah you know, you have your milk supply with just those two. I also like them because you can do non-dairy breeds of sheep and still get milk and you get better wool quality or better meat supply or, you know, what have you with that. So I really think they're a great option for the homesteader because, you know, a lot of us can't just dive in with a couple hundred acres and, you know, do the popular models of stuff. A lot of us right. I'm noticing have, you know, one acre or five acres or that kind of thing. And so, 
sheep really do fit well into that model, especially if you have multiple species. They're also really kid friendly, you know, because most breeds are under 200 pounds, more around 100 pounds. So we we just had our first kid and we're really looking forward to seeing how he grows up with the sheep and what he wants to do with them. But, you know, kids, kids love lambs, you know, they are very comfortable around sheep and playing with wool is a really great thing for kids to dive into because like felting is really super easy. It's a fun craft and then you have a great product at the end of it you can sell. But then I've actually taught kids to drop spindle, which is, it's like a disc with a stick and you just kind of twist it like a top and at the end of it you have yarn. So kids really like that. And then there's another product at the end of it. So they do require some skill learning curves when you get into it, but it's not ridiculous. Yeah. So now for those, I know there's people saying, I didn't even know you can milk sheep, right? Why don't you give us some of the benefits of sheep milk and what the difference is between sheep's milk, cow's milk, goat's milk, and all of that? Sure. So actually sheep were a far more popular homesteading dairy animal in the past than goat, than, than cows were, especially in the United Kingdom where sheep were such a popular animal for the wool and the meat. Actually quite a few people milked their sheep and didn't have cows. Um, and it wasn't until the industrial revolution that the cows became far more popular as a dairy animal. But the milk specifically, um, sheep milk has the lowest amount of lactose out of cow, goat, and sheep. So it's actually closest to human breast milk out of any of the milkable animals. So people who have issues digesting lactose products a lot of times can digest sheep milk. And if you are lactose intolerant, there was a Polish study where they had women consume, who are lactose intolerant, consume sheep milk kefir. And they found that the kefir in the fermentation process actually produced lactase. So even though they were lactose intolerant, they could consume it. It didn't quite work with yogurt, but it worked with the kefir. Mm. So sheep milk is also naturally A2A2, but it's a different kind of A2A2 than the cow. The fats are still, or the proteins are shaped differently. So we switched to A2A2 cow milk for a while, and we noticed a lot of health improvements with that. And then we got sheep just because it's a very long story involving COVID and all that gobbledygook. But we got sheep and we started (laughs) drinking the milk and we noticed that you know, our, we had other health issues just kind of disappear. Like we didn't realize we still had inflammation and consuming the sheep milk that actually started going away. So the proteins are smaller, more densely packed. And uh, the whey has the highest amount of certain proteins that are really beneficial, like proline, lactoferrin, erotic acid, and scientists are studying those proteins and just what health benefits they have. And it's really kind of exciting what those have. So goat and cow milk do have those proteins, but sheep milk has it at least two times the amount, if not more, depending where they're at and what they're eating. So that's the milk sugar, that's the protein. And then the fats are really kind of cool. They are smaller and have a higher distribution. And so there's more minerals with the sheep milk because fats and minerals are cofactors. So there's, there's a lot of specifics there too with the different fats. I, I can really geek out on stuff like that if yeah. you want to go into it. So, well, in general, it sounds like, you know, that there's just sheep milk in general is just healthier, even from goat's milk and cow's milk. I mean, it makes sense, right? You're taking a 100 to 200 pound animal that is going to feed a baby that will only weigh 100 to 200 pounds versus a thousand pound right. cow, right? Like that's raising a baby that's going to come to be a thousand pounds. And so one of the biggest questions people will ask is, well, what on earth does sheep milk even taste like? Is it is it homogenized? Is it non-homogenized? What's the difference in that? That's actually a big concern because, you know, I, I think goat milk, it, everyone, you either love goat milk or you hate goat milk and there's really no in between. So everyone comes to me and they're like, what is the sheep milk like? Like, is it like goat milk? So sheep milk is actually known as the champagne of milks. So it's very sweet. And like, I had a lady come over to my house and I gave her a little glass of sheep milk to try. And she liked it so much when she finished the glass, she went to the sink and rinsed the cup out and drank the rinse water because she loved it so much, which I personally would not do. (laughs) um, 
I have had toddlers come and they'll try like our raw Jersey milk and they're like, okay, that's fine. And then I have the toddlers try the sheep milk. I have to cut them off because they will just keep drinking it and drinking it and drinking it. I'm like, mama, yeah. you're going to have some interesting diapers tomorrow. <laughs> so it's, oh, um, yeah. and because of the higher fat, pro, uh, fat content, it's, I don't want to say it's like drinking half and half because especially if you have a Jersey cow and you have that half and half, it's, it's not really comparable. But if you took like store-bought right. half and half, you know, it's kind of between vitamin D milk and half and half in its thickness and stuff. So okay. it's very, it's not, it's not like goopy or too thick. It's just very satisfying. So like in the high right. summer when we are working and it's humid and you just don't want to eat at the end of our workday, we'll just sit and have a nice glass of sheep milk and we're good. Yeah. And fall asleep and we're full. Awesome. So why don't we talk about some sheep breeds? Like what are some dairy specific breeds that people can look for? And what would you recommend in regard to kind of like the first sheep? Like if somebody were getting into dairy sheep, mm -hmm. what were some breeds you would consider to get them started really well? So it is actually currently illegal to import sheep from other countries right now. And so when they closed the importation of sheep, we didn't have dairy specific breeds in this country except for the Clune Forest. So we have a breed registry for the Clune Forest. And I actually mainly started researching them recently. And I told my husband, I, I wish I knew about them sooner because that's probably the breed I would have picked if I could have, but I didn't know about them. So mm -hmm. there's Clune Forest, which is a British breed, and they're currently known mainly as a wool breed. So they have very nice wool in addition to their milk. Um, they're known as the Jersey cow of the sheep, of the dairy sheep. So they have a even higher fat content. Okay. So that that's Clune Forest. Um, they're probably the least well-known dairy breed, the dairy specific breeds of sheep. Um, the most well-known breed is the East Frisian. They're kind of the Holstein cow of the sheep world. They have the lowest fat content. They're really large um, animals. They produce a lot of sheep milk. There's some that will produce a gallon a day if you manage them. Right. Right. They're also a bit more fragile. They're more susceptible to diseases and parasites because they're putting all of their their inputs into the milk. So mm -hmm. people wanting East Frisians should be aware of that. Like if you... If you want to go in for East Frisians, make sure you talk to your breeder and ask, like, what are your management styles? How much intervention do you need to do? What are they eating? That kind of stuff. Because most of the East Frisian breeders I'm aware of feed a ton of corn to get that right. milk supply up. So, which isn't the end of the world. It's just I don't digest corn or soy very well. So I have to be careful about that right. when I'm buying in animals. So, and East Frisians have fairly decent wool. I, there, some people get really snobby about wool, but I like these Frisian wool for like home socks and sweaters and homesteading stuff. Yeah. And then there's the Awasi sheep. Globally, Awasi are the most common dairy breed. They're incredibly hard to get here in the United States. They are working on a breed registration for them. So it's mm. hopefully they'll be more accessible. But just in the United States, they're not very easy to come by and they're incredibly expensive. You have to be on a waiting list, but they are very hardy. They produce really good milk. And their fleece is definitely more rug yarn. So if you want to make carpets and stuff, that's... I also really love wool. Sorry, that's why I keep going into the, the types of wool these breeds have because I like wool. Anyway, so that's the Awasi. And then right. there's the Asaph breed, which is kind of a combination between the East Frisian and the Awasi. So they were taking the Awasi genes and bringing it to the East Frisian to try to get them to be a little bit hardier. So those are the dairy specific breeds. Now for a homesteader wanting to get into sheep dairy, I don't know if I would recommend them dive into a dairy specific breed right away, unless they were just completely sold. They wanted sheep milk just because again, they're hard to find. They're incredibly expensive. You're probably going to be on a waiting list. So it's going to take a lot of input and time to get those specific breeds. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that, you know, there's a lot of breeds of sheep and they all produce milk. And so the thing with that is that if you want to do a non-dairy specific breed of sheep, the main caveat is you don't know what their lactation time is going to be. You don't know what their udders are going to be like, and you don't know what their teats are going to be like, which if you're hand milking, like I do, knowing what their teats are going to look like is kind right. of a big deal. Very important. It's very important. <laughs> so 
We have Gulf Coast native sheep, which are a land race breed from the American South. And I have a couple ewes where they've got nice, long, the size of my finger type teats and I can grab onto them. And then I've got one where she has jelly bean teats and I have to milk her with my pinkies and it's yeah. awful. Versus like my East Frisian crosses, I mean, they've got nice, large teats that you should just grab onto and go. Now, if you're using a milking machine, that may not be as much of a concern, but if you want to hand milk, you just need to be considerate right. of that. So, yeah, that's what we did. So when we jumped into sheep, we had a friend and we have a, Rachel and I have a mutual friend who had some long wools for sale. And you guys have probably heard me talk about this a little bit since uh, the other two podcast episodes. And then I was able to ha- find our Ram, Steve, who is named before he came to us, uh, who is an East Frisian. Rachel actually helped me find him and made that connection. And so we were then quickly the proud owners of three Lincoln long wools and one East Frisian. And so the thought was actually one of the long wool ewes came to me with, a, you know, a fairly nice udder, not super long teats, but better than I thought they were going to be. Uh, and she mm-hmm. was just being weaned from her lamb when she came. And so I was able to milk her a little bit and it was very easy. I mean, she just, she was very easy to milk. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's been fun and we, we've been interested in seeing like what the offspring will be like. And, yeah. you know, the breeder of the East Frisian ram was telling us that basically whatever we breed him with will double that breeds milk production just because of what he is. And so that's really interesting too. So it's good for you guys that Mm -hmm. are listening to know, like you don't have to go out and buy the best of the best right away. The nice, other nice thing about sheep that we've kind of established in some of the other podcasts are that they breed very, very early, generally depending on the size and they only have a five month gestation period, right? Versus the nine month and they can have twins. They can multiple babies more than cows do. And so there's a whole lot of pros to sheep in general to where you can quickly build up your, your flock of sheep. And especially if it's dairy sheep. Um, so you're not waiting a year and a half to breed a cow and then waiting another nine months before you get offspring to get that milk. You're actually, you know, you're going into it, you're breeding and, and you're waiting a lot less time. And so mm-hmm. it is much easier for the homesteader to consider sheep as a viable dairy option. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this week's episode. We're going to take a quick break and bring you a word from one of our amazing sponsors. McMurray Hatchery officially started in 1917. Murray McMurray had always been interested in poultry as a young man and particularly enjoyed showing birds at the local and state fairs. Nowadays, the hatchery is still completely through mail order, but they offer way more than ever before. From meat chicks and layer hens to waterfowl, ducklings, goslings, turkeys, game birds, juvenile birds. They even have hatching eggs and a whole lot of chicken equipment. Make sure you check out our Homesteader of America sponsor, McMurray Hatchery at mcmurrayhatchery.com and get your orders in today. And don't forget to stop by their booth at the 2023 HOA event. Now, Mm -hmm. let's kind of talk about breeding just a little bit because breeding for dairy sheep is going to be a little bit more intensive, in my opinion, than it is for Mm -hmm. cows. Because from my research, obviously I haven't experienced it myself yet. My research is that a cow will definitely milk longer in most cases than a sheep will. So could we talk about that just a little bit? Yes. So sheep have, depending on the breed, have between a three to 10 month lactation cycle. So in Europe, where they have a really strong, pure East Frisian genetics, they will get a solid 10 months of milk from those ewes. So you, you kind of have to breed them back while they're still in lactation. Mm-hmm. My Gulf Coast native sheep have a three-month window. And as soon as we remove the lambs, they start drying up. So we have to lamb share with those sheep. So, again, you know, when you look at your breeds, you really want to ask some questions as to the lactation time. You know, what when do they pull lambs? When do they start winning? That kind of thing. So that's, that's like lactation length. You know, some people don't like that because with a cow, I mean, you can you can milk her for at least a year, sometimes two, depending on how you manage her. Um, sheep will just naturally dry off after a certain amount of time. I didn't mind that because that meant we got a break 
when we were managing things that way. And then what we did this year is we bred our dairy mutts in the fall for spring lambs. And then we bred our Gulf Coast natives in the spring. So we'll have fall lambs. So we will have a, a year's supply of sheep milk that way. So yeah, they're definitely different than cows in that respect. Yeah. Now, do dairy sheep need anything nutritionally different than other sheep, just regular sheep will need? Or have you found that they can survive basically the same way? You know, with dairy cows, obviously dairy cows and beef cows are two totally different sections of the cow (laughs) family. But are you seeing that with sheep, that dairy sheep need a little bit more in regard to nutrition or is it all broadly the same across the board? No, I mean, now that I have a son, I'm a lot more sympathetic to a dairy sheep's nutritional needs because I've noticed I need more (laughs) than I did before. Um, And so this, Mm -hmm. this kind of can get into a controversial topic, if you will. And I'm using air quotes for those listening, because, you know, if you get into a group of dairy shepherds and talk about feed, it's, it's like, oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Everyone has an opinion. Oh my right? goodness. Yes. And you know, I think too, there's, there's the whole grass fed movement. Like everyone's very concerned with grass mm-hmm. fed. And, you know, I was kind of struggling with this, but then I heard Beth's daughter point out, you know, the grass fed movement centered around cows because cows are designed to right. just eat grass. And so I have noticed where we have a Jersey cow and we also have sheep, you know, they eat different things. So the sheep, when they go into a new paddock, they will actually go in if there's seed heads on the grass and they'll eat those first and then they'll go down from there. They also want more leafy things like the clovers or, you know, they'll eat some multiflora rose and that kind of stuff. Um, whereas the cow will go straight for the grass. So, you know, you do want to make sure your sheep have plenty of grass or hay, but you also need to be aware that just in general, they do want some other things besides just grass. Right. And then when they're lactating, you know, if you're, if your management is you're leading lambs on and your milk sharing, which my personal opinion is you should, cause you have healthier lambs and better genetics down the road, you know, they're feeding those lambs and they're feeding you and they're trying to keep their, their own selves healthy. And so what we found is if we're not providing enough minerals and kelp and feed for our dairy use, they become incredibly susceptible to parasites and other health issues because they're dumping all of those nutrients to keep themselves healthy into the milk. Mm -hmm. Cows are much more selfish, if you will, with their vitamins and minerals, and they'll keep them from themselves. Sheep will dump it into the milk first. So, you know, we, we always make sure we've got really good quality minerals out for our girls, especially if they're lactating, um, just because they're, they're constantly dumping that into the milk. So, right. You know, and it's not just you're giving that to your sheep. You're also getting the benefit of those minerals too. So that's a nice benefit. Right. So, and then we've also just noticed feeding them in the stanchion. We use a milking stanchion to milk our sheep and having a good mix is really imperative. Again, I don't do corn or soy very well. Um, Corn and soy also ferment very quickly. So when you're feeding your sheep, you need to be aware that they have a rumen, which is essentially a fermentation vat for their digestive system. So you want a slower to ferment type supplement to feed them. Otherwise, you're going to have to deal with other health issues <laughs> if they get into too much right. corn and soy, because those two things have very high sugar, ferment very quickly. So we feed alfalfa pellets, lespedeza pellets, uh, shredded beet pulp, some oats, and some barley. So they kind of have a different spectrum of nutrients in their feed mix. And we've noticed they really do need, you know, a couple cupfuls of that per day when they're in the stanchion. You know, not depending on the size of the sheep. Like some, they just need about a cup and they're good. Like the the Gulf Coast don't need that much. But the big girls with these Frisian genetics where Mm -hmm. they've just been selectively bred for so many hundreds of years to have grain, they really benefit to have some grain consistently while they're lactating. So, right. And I love how you, you kind of pulled out the things that you give them because a lot of times um, people will just be like, okay, I'm going to go to my local feed store and I'm just going to say, give me a bag of sheep grain. Right. But I love that you said, you don't just yeah. go to the store and buy them a, a bag of sheep grain. You're, you're getting them rolled oats. You're getting them beet pulp. You're giving them things mm-hmm. like kelp and minerals. Right. And so just really for those of you who are, I know we have a lot of listeners that are like hardcore grass fed as you should be, but you know, mm-hmm. there are also options to not be like fully grain fed either. Like you can have compromises based on those genetics that you have or based on what your sheep needs, like 
it's like Rachel said, like they're in the field and they're eating the seed tops first, which is technically a grain. If you think about it, um, if they were in a wheat mm-hmm. field, they'd be eating those wheat tops first or an oat field, they'd be eating those oat tops first. And so yeah. even just a little bit of those rolled oats kind of, it helps pack that, that weight on them and put the energy out with milk too. And so it's nice to see, like, we always have, a lot of times we have hardcore people on here who are like, no, 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 no grain, no, 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 none of that. Yeah. But there are ways to compromise too, based on the breed that you get and then transitioning more to the genetics that you want over the year, uh, years as you get into more breeding and holding back mm-hmm. and all of that. So, um, yeah. that's really cool. And if you want to go 100% grass fed, you can do that, but you need to have a, you have to have very high quality pastures and you need to have a lot of land because sheep are incredibly more susceptible to parasites than cows are. Like if you own sheep, you are going to become a parasitologist. That's just what's going to happen. You're going to, I mean, because they have a lot of different things. So if you want to do grass fed, you can do that. They need to be moved twice a day every single day onto fresh pasture. And it's got to be very good quality pasture. And you kind of need to know what those sheep need because again, they eat different than cows do. So, you know, if you have only eight and a half acres, like I do, you can't, you just can't do grass fed sheep, sheep milk. And, and, you know, if you want to provide your own milk supply. Right. Yeah. And so that's why it's good for you guys to look into the genetics of whatever sheep you're getting. Like Rachel said earlier, like, Do they convert grass well? Do they not convert? Just like cows, Mm -hmm. uh, just on a smaller package level. like, um, And then also keep in mind what your property has to offer those sheep, just like with a cow. What does your property have to offer? So we kind of had an aha moment because – um, 50% of our property essentially is pasture. It was just old, you know, hay field that was managed not well the last 20 years, but still nonetheless, it was managed. And then we have partially wooded or silvo pasture, which was really great for sheep. Like they thrive yeah. well on silvo pasture. And so our sheep were under stress when they first came to us. And I'm not sure if I've said this in one of the other podcasts, but I'll share it here. Um, they were pretty stressed out even just a very short ride here. Like we don't even live that far apart from the the breeder we got them from. And so we found like what Rachel just said, because parasite counts are there, you know, sheep are so susceptible to parasites. We started moving them more frequently. So, and we also gave them a diverse area of nutrition. So instead of just pasture, when we moved them to our back part of the property with silvo pasture, they immediately, their health immediately took a turn for the better. And they just knew how to Mm self-medicate. They knew how to do what they needed to do. And they were better within like 24 to 48 hours. It was pretty incredible to watch. And so the other thing about sheep too, especially dairy sheep, is what we've been finding is that dairy sheep, especially when they're hungry, they will eat and eat and eat, right? Like, so they will, they will rip your grass up if you are, you know, on a small acreage, especially, or if you leave them in one place for too long. And that's because they have to, like they are putting out a product for you and your homestead. And so those are just things to keep in mind if you're bringing on dairy sheep onto your property, because they will eat and they have to eat and they will eat at whatever cost it is to keep producing that, that nutrition, um, in their milk. And so just as you're a new homesteader or even an experienced one that wants to get into dairy sheep, Those are things to consider. I have found that I have to manage my property way more with sheep than I do with a cow. Like they, they require a few more strands of polywire versus the cow who can, I can get away with one strand (laughs) of polywire. And so there are a ton. (laughs) Yeah, no, there are a ton of pros to dairy sheep and there are some cons to dairy sheep, just like there's pros to cows and there's pros, you know, there's cons to cows. And so what I'm really enjoying is like we're we're putting all of that out there because we really I think Rachel would agree we really believe that dairy sheep are the next big thing for homesteaders yes. because they are you can have more uh, on your property. I think we've established you can have four to five sheep, which equals one cow essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you are you've got five sheep on your homestead property, so you're milking a couple of ewes, right? Then you're getting milk, but it's a sustainable option for milk. And so for small homesteads like Rachel has eight acres, we have almost six acres, it it might be a more sustainable option for you, which leads me into Rachel is writing a book about this. So you guys have all of the information 
in your fingertips. Because let me tell you, y'all, there are like no books about sheep dairy except for this really expensive. I'm holding up for you two people the practical sheep dairying book by Olivia Mills, which is forever and an age old. <laughs> and it costs like 150 bucks online. Like you can't find it for less than that. No. And it's just crazy because they don't print it anymore. So Rachel was like, listen, there's a need and I'm going to fill it. So Rachel, why don't you tell us really quickly about your book? Yeah. So I actually have to give credit to Homesteaders of America because we went and had a booth of sheep milk soap and a couple of people bought the soap, but most people wanted to talk to us about sheep dairy. And I just, I didn't know that they were on the upswing as far as popularity went and this one guy came in and was just asking question after question after question. So I'm trying to answer as best I can, just not having prepared. And he finally just like waves his arms and yells at me. And he goes, where's your book? Where's your podcast? Where's your <laughs> pamphlet? Where's your class? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, we need this. So you need to provide it. And I was like, uh, okay. And he, he left and I looked at my husband. I'm like, I guess I should write something. And he's like, I guess you should. And the rest is history. So, so it's because of Homesteads America this book is in existence. So, oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, so I am I am writing a book, and Sawdust Publishing is putting it out. And so I've been working with Janet Garman, who is just an absolute joy and blessing, and so helpful. So it's going to be thirteen chapters. Um, we're going to go over you know, why own sheep, why have sheep milk specifically. So I'll go over all, you know, in a lot more detail, all the details of the nutritional profile of the sheep milk. Um, I talk about how to feed your sheep and how to kind of decide what you're going to feed them based off of their nutrition needs. I had go over breeds a lot <laughs> because again, I, I have both. I have dairy mutts and I have non-dairy sheep. So I kind of go over the pros and cons of, you know, when do you want a dairy specific sheep? When do you want a non-dairy specific sheep? I might do even talk about milking hair sheep for those of you who are right. diehard Katahdin and Dorper fans. So I also have interviews from other dairy shepherds in there, which... I'm excited about. And yes, we do have some recipes in there. We've got other things about recipes kind of in the works, but I don't know if I should talk about that just yet. But maybe um, not. Maybe <laughs> not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mean, if you want like a, you know, I'm a homesteader, I'm interested in sheep, what do I do? This is the book where I was trying to just say, okay, you know, this isn't geared towards a professional sheep dairy or a big, huge, you know, sheep operation. This is more for the homesteader who's like, I want to do this sustainably. I want to do this affordably. I want to do this enjoyably. So, because that's, that's the other thing. I mean, there's sheep are the most joyful, fulfilling heartbreak you are ever going to experience because they're, they're very fragile and they're very loving and they're very stubborn. Yeah. And so uh, I, I want to, help and encourage people to find ways to emphasize the joy of shepherding because the heartbreak just kind of volunteers to jump yeah. out and smack you. Yeah. Well, you're, I think you've reached it at the right time for, especially for homesteaders wanting to learn more. Um, you guys, you can check the show notes for a link where you can pre-order the book. The book is not out yet. Do you have a title for the book yet? The Guide to Homestead Dairy Sheep. Okay. So you can check that out below in the show notes and links are all there. And if you want to go through transcript or anything of this to kind of pull out all these nuggets that Rachel's given us, um, you can find that on our, our blog uh, at homesteadersofamerica.com. And all of this information that she's been talking about will be in there. Is there anything else, Rachel, that you feel like people need to know about dairy sheep before we hop off here? Oh, <laughs> there's lots of things. You know, we have a dairy cow and we have dairy sheep and I have owned dairy goats in the past. We joke, my, my friend who's a fellow dairy shepherdess, we joke that dairy goats are like dogs and dairy sheep are more like cats. You know, so they're they're much more standoffish. They're much more whatever. But once you become their shepherd, mm -hmm. it's it's really amazing. And as a Christian, you really start to understand the heart of our Lord so much more profoundly than you did before you owned sheep. And I think that was the most surprising thing for me is learning, like, we would get through this really frustrating thing with a sheep. And at the end of it, I would be like, oh, those darn sheep. Mm -hmm. And they... Oh, okay, Jesus, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I do right. That. <laughs> right. Like, like why so, do you do the stupid things you do? Right. And then you're like, oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And and the other thing would be on a much more materialistic level, you know, dairy sheep are wool sheep, which scares a lot of people because they're like, I don't know what to do with wool. And I would just really encourage people, you know, wool is really a gift to homesteaders, especially. There are so many uses mm-hmm. for it. It's We've become so much healthier since wearing wool products in the winter and using it in our daily life. So don't let the wool scare you. Like it's, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So many things. And if you guys want to know all about wool, check out the podcast episode, a couple podcasts back, or maybe it was right before this. Janet Garman talks about wool and wool sheep and um, all kinds of fun things about that. And she has a book about that too. So Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me, Rachel. This has been super fun and I'm sure lots of homesteads are going to have dairy sheep on them soon. Yay! (laughs) Thanks for having me, Amy. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us on this week's Homesteaders of America podcast. Make sure you're subscribed if you are not already. Check out the show notes in the link below. And until next time, happy homesteading. Hey, thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's Homesteaders of America episode. We really enjoyed having you here. We welcome questions and you can find the transcript and all the show notes below or on our Homesteaders of America blog post that we have up for this podcast episode. Don't forget to join us online with a membership or just to read blog posts and find out more information about our events at homesteadersofamerica.com. We also have a YouTube channel and follow us on all of our social media accounts to find out more about homesteading during this time in American history. All right, have a great day and happy homesteading.